All right. Good morning. How's everyone doing? It's a little bit of energy. That's good. Cool. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple things over the next half hour. The, the first is the DStore REST API, which is a project that's actually come together from, from several different teams around uh, the Protocol Labs network. And, and the thought here is really about um, making sure that the interface to Filecoin, so how you're getting data in and out of Filecoin, uh, is, is a reasonable interface that people are happy to build on. Like, how do we, how do we get that sort of set of nuances uh, structured so that you can get started really quickly and that you can bring in the additional sort of pieces that differentiate Filecoin in different ways that you care about, but you don't have to understand everything. Um, so hands up for those of you who have stored data on Filecoin. There's a couple, that's good. Um, for those of you, you'll already know that the journey looks something like this. There's a, there's a few steps involved. Um, you need to process your data and prepare it. And so that's getting it into a content addressed format uh, and getting it into then a deal format, right? Right now, what Filecoin in general is taking is that uh, data uploads are in 32 gigabyte segments. And so if you've got your data not in 32 gigabyte segments, which is very common, uh, there's some transformation to get it into chunks of that size. Then you have to send it to the storage providers we have the, the internals that provide our security guarantees around how we seal that data. You get this hash slash proof back. What are you gonna do with that? Um, in general, that's like the important thing because that's what's providing you with your security guarantees, but it's a new concept, right? That, that figuring out how you're storing that metadata, where you're putting that, what, how you understand and interpret the security associated with this remote storage, and when you feel comfortable removing that data locally from disk because you feel like you've successfully offloaded it. All of that is nuance around the Filecoin protocol that right now we're expecting every integration to sort of read up on and understand, right? And if you want to delve one layer deeper, you certainly can. This is a rabbit hole, right? And I, I think that's sort of the basic point is that for each of these, as you, as you work for best practices, as you work for what is the efficient way to stream your data out to the storage provider, to both be transforming it, managing the proofs, managing what your temporary directory is, uh, making sure you've got the right number of replicas, uh, and, and whether you're going to do your replication and your sort of healing of data if it ever gets lost, um, as transfers, transfers between your different storage provider copies, um, versus when it makes sense to pull one and then send it back out. And then especially the second part of how you're getting it back out from your storage providers and, and what those units are and how if, if the, the things that you want back will be a single file, right? Something that is meaningful to you, not a 32 gig chunk. And so how are you going to ask for part of the deal back and then make sure you're actually getting the right thing back when you do that? So there's a lot of complexity that's possible here. Uh, and that today is largely exposed to the integration layer. Uh, and, and so that's, that's sort of the, the basic problem space that we're working in. Um, you need some sharp tools, you need some bridges to be built. Uh, so there, there's a, a project that's been worked on over the last half year or so uh, called the DStore REST API that's meant to abstract a lot of that complexity and provide an intermediate uh, library that lets you build with just the complexity that you actually need. Um, here's the basics of what this looks like. You're going to post your objects to an HTTP endpoint, and you can then get those IDs back. Um, and then we provide sort of a third status API that allows you to see what the status of these blob objects are. So, you know, this is replicated on these two SPs. It's been proved in the last day. So you get timestamps of when the last window posts and sort of validation that this data actually has been stored by which SPs, how it is compared to your policy. The, the rough set of you know, status of this data that you might care about and might want to sort of expose up to users, but it's a JSON thing where you can only consume the subset and, and that's not the semantics. The semantics is you post, you get, 
and then you've got a config file that has your basic policy that you want followed. And so you can put this as an intermediate rather than dealing with the subsequent complexity of how you actually store that data into Filecoin as a distributed system. Um, and so the thought is there's a couple different ways that this API can get integrated. It can end up um, as, as a integration provider for its customers. So as you've got these sort of integration service providers that are aggregating data from many sub end, end user customers, they could be running an instance of this or they could be integrating this integration layer down to their customers. Um, you can run it on premises or you can run it close to where your data is. It's really just a Docker container. Right? It, it's got some storage for a temporary pool of, of data that, it, that it's holding on to and preparing into deals. Um, but, but the thought is that the, this intermediate layer that you need that's got some of the thoughts of what a client should be doing can be abstracted away from, from having to deal with the distributed system. Um, that, that we want sort of a, a, a relatively straightforward client container that abstracts a lot of this. Um, the, the general thought here uh, of what we're targeting is that you're storing on the order of a terabyte or more per day. That's where this thing is, is structured. It's expecting to be doing a fair amount of bandwidth and deals. Um, and and the, 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 the caveat here or the reason that you're thinking about that is things like, should it be proactively making deals? If you're doing something where you're you know, in a very bursty thing where you'll, you'll push some files and then you'll wait a couple days, but you might want that to be you know, stored and flushed, we're not really like trying to solve all of these different types of flushing use cases or real-time data, and we're assuming that you've just got enough bulk volume of stuff happening that the as deals fill up that is, is a good enough policy for those cases. Um, so if you've got a large data set you're onboarding or you're sort of in a continuous way onboarding long data sets, you don't have to worry about this flushing side of the semantics. Um, we'll probably eventually be adding some additional hooks to help you get more fine-grained management of that part of the complexity. Um, but that, that's sort of a piece that we find that at least the current integrators, it's a ways down the path where they're like, oh, and then I finished my data set and I had like an extra gigabyte of stuff and that hasn't actually ended up stored permanently. What's going on? And you're like, okay, well, if you just keep pushing stuff, it's not a problem. And that generally is good enough as the first pass. So this comes a few, a few edges down. Um, Okay, so this is really about sort of aligning you know, what people are after. As, as you've got this relationship that we see fairly commonly and that a lot of data is getting pushed into Filecoin right now where you've got a separation between clients who really just want to store and retrieve data and mostly care about contracting to someone to deal with that technical complexity, which happens quite a bit today, right? When, when you think about uh, the entities that actually have their data and are pushing it outside of their direct application or premises. And so, you know, they might try and store their backup to Amazon or to some cloud or whatever. They're rarely the ones who are doing that integration over to, to Amazon. And instead, they're finding some aggregator, some integration partner that has pre-built a bunch of hooks to the different clouds and is able to come in and say, okay, if here's, here we'll, we'll actually do some of this solutions architecting to pull that a little bit closer to what your existing data structure is and then get that to flow out to your offsite backups and so forth. And so we want to position Filecoin to be able to be an equivalent offsite backup for these sorts of integration partners and these setups um, where you've got uh, the, these contract things of I want my offsite backup. How do you align that so that it's a pretty, it, it's able to integrate into these standard workflows? Um, so so here's, here's another sort of graph about this. The, the, I think there's a couple things to note here that are exciting compared to what you might already have in custom integrations. Uh, one, one of those is we're dealing with the retrieval side as well. So you've got these individual files or blobs of data that you're storing in the same way that you would S3 uh, or, or any other sort of uh, blob store. There's no sizing requirements on those. Those can be small individual objects. Those can be very large blobs, five terabyte objects, something like that. The HTTP interface lets you efficiently store those and then retrieve them again. And so you're not having to see the 32 gigabyte deal boundaries in that process. Uh, we can do partial deal retrievals and we can span across multiple deals and give you back 
the object in the way that you've got your, your semantics. And so we're, we're patching over a lot of the internal nuance that, that Filecoin is exposing for its proof system and its security um, to give you something that's closer to what an end user already has. Um, the, the retrieval side of that in particular is one that's still really evolving fairly quickly. And so getting that to be reliable and seamless uh, through a custom integration takes a fair amount of work. Uh, and so we think there's some value in packaging that up for easy reuse. Uh, so the current status, there is uh, a repo. That's a QR code link to that repository uh, that you can spin up. That's a container. Uh, it gives you this API uh, that you can build integrations against uh, or store and retrieve data. Uh, there is a supported S3 compatibility layer on top of it. So if you really want to do a drop-in replacement of something that's already going to S3 buckets, uh, you, can, you can do that. There's an additional layer that uh, sort of adds the additional logic shim to be API compatible with S3. Uh, and then we are actively working with some integration partners to be testing and you know, getting reliability, getting documentation up to where people can independently set this up and start using it. Um, we've, we've been doing that for a month and a half, a couple months now. Um, Onboarding going well, retrieving going well. I think the the sort of like additional pieces that we're we're working on, and there there's some additional uh, features that that are sort of the next layer. And then it's also hardening, and so we're starting to see sort of these initial uh, deal renewals, things like that, that show that we actually are are doing well on that perpetual storage guarantee that people want, and that that sort of confidence that this is bug free and going to be you know suitable for you know your sensitive data uh, comes with time. Um, there's a set of uh, topics where we'd love additional input and direction on you know, which of these are most important to you guys. Um, thinking about access control, there's a couple things here. Right now, the model is generally that this uh, component is the component that both will store and then retrieve. And so the, this integrating partner will work with a, a set of partner storage providers to be making these deals and then getting uh, data back. Part of what that initial contract can be that's very simple on both sides is you, you limit retrieval access back to the same integration provider. And that has solved many of the sort of, you know, the, this sort of 80% uh, set of use cases, which is I need, I'm an individual entity, I'm storing my backups, I may need it back. The access control policy of I'm the one who's going to pull it back, great, solves that. Um, we have, we're starting to get some uh, interest in people who have, as clients, their own end users. And so they would like their own end users who are different machines to also be able to do the retrievals. Uh, and so we're working through options around uh, pre-signed URLs uh, or, or other sort of capability-based things where you can allow your clients when they're doing retrievals to directly go to a storage provider and, and get access to those chunks of data that they might want, which saves a double uh, network cost. Um, and so there, there's some use cases where that's gonna be a useful efficiency um, and we're, we're sort of seeing if that matches well with the, the set of users that find this uh, product desirable. Um, there, there's different uh, mechanisms around paid deals uh, that come in here. Um, so it's, it's whether you're paying in-band as part of your protocol, so pay per byte, versus you're paying through sort of a, a contract where you've preset a rate uh, with your storage provider saying, you know, we'll settle up at the end of the month at some dollars per terabyte per month, um, and, and just thinking through those different deal constraints that the two sides are sort of modeling there as we get into things like hot storage or other types of retrievals, the, the ways that these integrators are generally thinking about price change a bit. And so we're, we're working through that landscape. Inputs on what sorts of payment uh, methodologies are most native to you, super useful here. Um, and then uh, we're continuing to sort of refine that status endpoint. Uh, there's, there's interesting edges. You've got a really large data that's across many deals. What does status mean here? Is it aggregated so that you just get a, all of your data has been proved, you're good? Is that enough or do you want to know that you know, some parts of that data were proved 10 hours ago and other parts of that data were proved 15 hours ago? There's a lot of nuance you can get into and what layers of that getting exposed uh, and how much is just sort of noise or too much. Is, is something we're still sort of working through, you know, what, where's the value 
and when have we just given you too many hashes and sort of not really given you something you actually want to show clients. Um, you can try it out. There's demo hosted ones where you can play against the API. You can spin up a Docker container and just do it locally, or you can spin up a Docker container, set a config, and have it actually store back to storage providers. Um, so this is uh, an exciting uh, interface that makes Filecoin a lot easier to integrate and make use of. Um, we really are targeting relatively large uh, amounts of data. That's probably the one caveat here. Um, but love to get in touch. There's a, there's a sort of contact information. We're happy to work with you to make sure that this can uh, solve what you need. So that's the DStore uh, REST API. Happy to take uh, a couple questions. There's a microphone coming for you in a second. Hey, uh, Andreas here from Legacy. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you address or do you address at all the question of the storage provider selection? Cool. And, so, yeah. and, and if so, uh, is there sort of non-functional parameters I can specify? So, for example, location, reputation, uh, speed, capacity, and what have you? Yeah, so, so the, the question around SP selection, which SPs you're going to be storing your data back to, is one of the key things that sort of emerged as you know, this, this decentralized marketplace and, and thinking through how do you match clients and providers. And so you've got a couple options. The first is you find a set of SPs that you think are matching your criteria. And so if you've got relatively strict criteria where you need to do things like validate SOC 2 compliance, or you really need to actually go audit the facilities and make sure they're in the country they say they are because your country is not going to leave it. You're going to do that probably out of band, right? You're going to go find those entities and then identify who they are, and then you can just have your fixed list of my storage providers are these ones that I have vetted meet my criteria, and now I'm pretty confident that I've audited that my data is not going to go somewhere outside of that criteria. So that's, that's sort of option one, is you take on that path. Uh, one of the major things that DStore is able to help with is matchmaking and identifying for a criteria how to sort of help you curate that list of storage providers that meet the criteria that you can be working with in storing data. Um, and, and so we've got a lot of partnerships with different storage providers. I think there is a lot of uh, possibility in pre-negotiated contracts, essentially, where what can happen is um, we can sort of have templates and say, this is sort of the basics of both pricing and expected deal, deal rates and, and retrievals and bandwidth. We've already talked to these pool of SPs. They're on board with it. If you sign on as a client side, you can get started with much less hassle than having to do those negotiations one-on-one -on -one without the context of you know, what that um, sort of general set of expectations that everyone's sort of cool with. Uh, are. So uh, that, that's sort of two. And three is there are basic policies that, that you can automatically do. So you, you get a, a, a bit less auditing. That's uh, sort of a, a deeper technical work that is ongoing for how do you make sure that you've got the confidence when you just go to some arbitrary storage provider that they're going to give you the retrieval capabilities that you're expecting, the latency, that they're going to keep storing stuff. If you get halfway through your data set and then they're full and stop taking your deals, and you have to switch, and now your data is split across two places, you might be unhappy. Um, so, so there's a set of these risks that you, you take on in a fully decentralized marketplace. For some data sets where you care really primarily about price, that may be OK. You may be willing to take on those risks. Um, but, but as you get to data where you want reliability and you want sort of more certainty, you're likely to do either a matchmaking or a negotiated contract beforehand. Uh, thank you so much. Like, this is so needed in the ecosystem. So just like a huge round of applause to this team who's putting this together. <laughs> um, I have three questions. Um, who's running an instance of this now, like in the beta testing? Uh, we've got a couple. Um, there is DWS yeah. is, is working through it for, for a set of their clients. Um, and then uh, there's a hosted instance that we're making available to a couple others as they begin integrating. Um, uh, and then we've got a couple who are testing it internally, but I don't think I'm supposed to say names uh, publicly yet. Gotcha. Um, how does the fill plus allocation work in all this? So there's a couple different options for fill plus. The integrator can get data cap. We can help work with that. Um, or you can just do it as non fill plus deals and just get payments directly from your clients. So both of those are things that we're experimenting with. 
Okay, great. And then um, can you walk through, I, I know it's, yep. it's kind of roadmap, but can you walk through how the payments might work? Um, um, so if I'm a client trying to pay for this, how that flow works? Yeah. Sure. So, so I mean, there's a couple different options that we've ended up with. So you can imagine in things like Phil Plus deals, you may not have a direct payment per deal besides the, the data cap uh, associated with that. But then what you'll negotiate separately from that is the expected integrator SP uh, cost of data storage. And then that will be sent as just a transaction at the end of the month or things like that within a legal contract. And so rather than having that be in band, it still is a, a payment, but it doesn't end up happening in the deal flow. So it's not in band. We also do support in band where there's a wallet um, and, and it's just a, a fill transfer as part of the deal flow. Um, so we can do either way. Um, it, it's been sort of integrating with what clients are expecting in terms of is this a PO order that gets fulfilled at the end of the month, which some of them are more happy to, to handle versus are they okay with pre-funding a wallet and having it go as they set, store the deals. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Thank you. Cool. All right. I'm going to then give a very quick, quick uh, allusion slash overview to a topic that Patrick covered in the last half hour, which is thinking about... Um, further codifying and refining retrievability. So what is retrieval? When we think about the different types of retrieval, we see that this is a really broad marketplace, right? There's not a single thing that, that people expect necessarily, and we have to be a fair amount more precise when we're talking about retrieval. Because retrieval spans from a CDN-like experience that may be branded and paid for as something like CloudFront through objects, that are paid per access, things like S3, which itself is further differentiated potentially based on your access pattern. And then there's archival retrieval and archival data storage where you were likely willing to pay more for retrievals because they're infrequent. And so your access, your amount of bandwidth, and where that data is getting sent to are all factors that uh, lead to a differentiation in how a provider is going to think about price um, and the price that clients are expecting and willing to pay. One of, the, one of the things here that, that we think is sort of interesting is that that differentiation, uh, if, we, if we leave it as just a really open, well, you know, you set the point that, you know, it is. A lot of people don't necessarily know exactly what that point is. They, they can't predict for most data, as you put your next cat picture, you don't know how popular it's going to be. You don't know if you need to set that at the one gigabit of bandwidth per day versus the two gigabit of bandwidth per day. That's not, that's not something that's easily predictable and because it has a lot of burstiness and a lot of variability. But you probably do know a rough class. You know if you need to have this uh, stored at a CDN level versus stored at an archival level. Is this something that you've got a lot of interactive users who are going to want with low latency or is this something that's a backup class that you might need once in a year, right? The, that, that sort of differentiation people are able to do really like having that nailed down, what is the service level exactly that I want, starts to get too precise for people to be able to predict. And so by leaving the space very open where every contract is gonna have to just set some point and guess at it, you're not necessarily doing people a favor. And so one of the things we'd like to do is standardize a few sets of retrieval expectation levels that match sort of these general buckets that people will, will find their data to fit within. Uh, because by narrowing the space so that instead of it just being this open plane where you can't really guess, at least now there's just sort of a standard expectation level. And then we can develop a bunch of additional products around those expectations. So this is sort of the basic sort of differentiation levels that we're, we're proposing to start with. Um, you've got CDN stuff. It's unlikely that a single storage provider where the data is ultimately housed in one disk somewhere is going to be able to, or is going to want to be providing CDN levels. CDN tends to be when the data is already in a bunch of places. And so in general, we expect that it's probably this sort of public S3 equivalent layer of I've got data that I'm gonna be sending back, hopefully less than a second, but somewhere around a second, which is also what you see with S3. And that that data maybe is happening on the order of once, in a, once a day or so, uh, any given object is getting fetched. Um, that, that's sort of what you see as the, the sort of standard expectation around something like S3, and that's sort of the, the higher bandwidth tier that you might have for online data that's getting actively retrieved from a single endpoint. 
If you want more than that, you're likely going to be caching it in a lot of places because you know, with that additional bandwidth, you're likely also going to want lower latency. Uh, there, there's other use cases. The other one that we've split out here is this sort of online, which represents a lot of data set or data processing use cases. So if you've got your ML workload, you've got a MapReduce workload or Spark, these sorts of scientific data sets or other things where there's a bulk patch processing job maybe once a week across a large data set, it's gonna be accessed a little less frequently. It's likely to be accessed by one client, but it's more than archival. And so there is another layer in there that we see data getting used at a lot. Uh, and then you've got sort of the more standard backup that's not being accessed very regularly at all and has a much lower bandwidth cost. So that's, that's the initial tiering that we're sort of setting out. Um, I think the interesting thing here is if you think about things that are data that's like archival, where it's maybe being accessed every month or every couple months, you can already work back how much bandwidth you might expect a storage provider to have to be, addressed, to, to be providing the expectation that clients would have for that data. So if you've got a median SP, a median Filecoin storage provider that has four petabytes of data stored, and that data is being accessed on the order of once a month, you're starting to get up to about a 10 gigabit link that that provider would need to have to serve that retrieval. Um, the data is gonna be bursty, but as you get up to something like four petabytes, it's gonna be smooth across those different bursts because it's, oh, this client lost their hard drive and needs to like pull back their 100 terabytes. Okay, but not all of your clients hopefully are losing their hard drives at the same time. And so what you end up with uh, if you just sort of smooth that pretty easily with a, a relatively small overhead for burstiness, is you get somewhere around seven gigabits per second. We might argue that this is a little bit high, um, and, and so that's, that's a, a debate I'd love to have, is like where do we think that this baseline archival is? What I'm putting here is about four retrievals over six months. The reason we did four is that what we're seeing is that the most common replication factor for data is that it's replicated to five providers. And the way you're gonna keep your resiliency nines is that even if four of those five providers lose the data, you can re-replicate it to five providers. And that would mean doing four data transfers. Um, so that baseline of over a deal's lifetime, we want to have reserved the capacity to do four data transfers out as sort of a baseline resiliency health of the network leads us to somewhere in this ballpark for what bandwidth we might expect from providers. Um, so so the, there's, there's two sort of nice things that come out of this that I think are worth noting. One is that when we talk about this from this network health perspective, the delta between here and online retrievals is maybe a two to five X increase in bandwidth. The cost of going from a 10 gig link to a 20 gig or a 40 gig link is not a five X cost. It's maybe a two X cost, depending on where you are. I see, I see other people who know about these, the, the cost of internet sort of giving me a side eye on that, and that is true, but um, the, the interesting thing to me at least is once you've provisioned up to 10 gigs and set that as sort of the, the sort of standard expectation, the, the cost to get a second 10 gig link, is, 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 you know what you're doing, and so the ops cost is quite a bit less, and in general, uh, bandwidth is not a linear cost at that uh, level. We've laid this out uh, in a FIP and a FIP discussion that's proposed. Love comments on that um, about sort of setting these tiers. This isn't yet doing anything with incentives uh, or changing any of the costs or anything. It's just laying out these SLA levels as levels to standardize upon and then arguing that one of the things we might want to start doing uh, with direct data onboarding is have clients specify whether data is archival versus uh, they expect high retrieval with that data so that a storage provider, when it goes to accept a data, knows what it's getting into and can differentiate pricing based on that, right? So if you get asked to store some data with high retrieval, you can price that higher because that's a thing you might want to do. It's going to cost you more. Um, so we'd like to have the ability to have that negotiation as part of deal making. Couple questions to leave you with here that I'd love input on and love to have conversations around. Did we get those tiers right? Are those levels of bandwidth and so forth that come out of them reasonable? Is there more flexibility? Are there other points in that spectrum that we should be also standardizing and letting people choose? And then how do we understand 
uh, the, what the provided bandwidth that we're getting is at. Uh, should we be, uh, we, we've got some thoughts towards measurement systems to be able to observe how much bandwidth we're seeing from providers. We're gonna keep working on those systems, um, but, but getting uh, higher certainty and sort of uh, expectations that a client can have of, okay, this provider is on a 10 gig link and they're using about half of it, so they've got plenty of capacity for your data, uh, is a useful thing for confidence building. And so as we refine these measurement tools so that we can help clients uh, understand how much capacity is available and whether it's going to be enough for their data sets, um, we, we think that also helps refine this market and lets pro clients make better choices about how they store their data. Um, so any thoughts on those sorts of measurement systems and how we better understand what bandwidth is available is a conversation I'd love to have. So with that, I think I'm at the end of this talk. Thank you all. Uh, and, and I think I, I have a question. You've got a microphone. Can you, can you explain exactly how this fits into the FIP? So is it basically like, a, like something within a deal that filters into one of those five categories or something? Or? Exactly. Yeah. So, so we have an enum for those different tiers. And then that, is this archival versus is this online expectation, is something that would go into a client deal proposal or the equivalent uh, with direct data onboarding. Gotcha. And, um, and then if a storage provider picks it up, they self-select into one of those, or is there some... Well, they're agreeing to what the client has proposed. Gotcha. Okay. And so then what, what that means, though, is it gives, it, uh, it gives the network a visibility into sort of the total scope of the retrieval expectations of deals that providers have taken on and are currently storing. Awesome, awesome. Th this is great. Okay, cool. Very thank. Thank you very much. I have a question around. Um, <clears throat> currently, I believe there's a, a fast retrieval bit inside of deals that again clients can already set. Do we have visibility into like what percentage of client deals today are setting the fast retrieval? Um, My bit? understanding is that uh, for the last few. Uh, client ask uh, iterations, that bit has been removed. So we don't have that visibility right now. Gotcha. That sucks. I'm glad we're adding it back. Uh, I think this is something we spoke about before already. I, I was just um, going to say it out loud here. I, I think it's there's like public and private data. And we heard back at Phil Dev Summit in Iceland that some storage providers are taking storage deals for data which their clients don't want anyone to ever retrieve. It just wants to be stored. Um, so I, I think that there's like almost two axes rather than just being like online and public and CDN. It's kind of public and private as well as the kind of availability that you can retrieve it. I think that's right. I think figuring out what an ACL like expectation is, is probably a different FIP that we need to think through a little bit more, um, where you can talk about a deal and have some way for the network to know who's able to interact with this deal. Yeah, from, from my understandings, and we were maybe in different conversations in Field of Iceland, but um, at least the, the community that I was chatting with, um, there is definitely public and private, but there are very few, like, fully private full or clients that that never want even themselves to be able to get the data back. Um, like, <laughs> at that point, <laughs> uh, I can't use this as a backup. I can't rely on Filecoin. If I can literally never get my data out of it, then, like, is it really doing that much for me? Um, and so I, I think it's the, the ACLs. The um, nuance there, yeah. Yeah, to, to at least permission it. it Oh yeah, uh, and and will what what happens to existing deals? Um, does this field this basically... does describe the expectations here, which uh, is that uh, fill plus deals that are existing would be considered archival, and uh, non fill plus deals that are existing would be considered offline. Okay, cool. And then th there's an opportunity upon renewal to change those. Exactly. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I work on the. Filecoin Foundation social impact team. We're mostly interested in large public data sets. Uh, and we're specifically interested in how much retrievals might charge uh, public data set consumers in the future. Do these SLA categories cover anything related to future cost expectations? Nope. Are there plans to add yep. that? Can you say more? 
uh, likely as we, we get this information, then the next thing is to think about incentive slash pricing around it. We haven't done that economic thing of how much should it cost to, to go there. That's going to vary based on where the provider is. The cost of bandwidth is different in different places. And so that is, that is a market. And that, that's then sort of a next piece, which is um, something that I think we're hoping to address in a couple ways. Um, one is, yeah, you should have this negotiation where you're like, hey, provider in the marketplace, I want this with higher retrieval, how much more does that cost? And you'll get in that negotiation of the ask what they think their bandwidth is going to cost for that additional retrieval service. So that's, that's sort of like the baseline. And then you've got the question of how does the network align to help incentivize and push towards better reliable retrieval. And that's going to have to do with potentially fill plus allocator pathways that incentivize additional uh, retrieval capabilities, or even block rewards, where we say, OK, you're, you're meeting your SLAs uh, and doing that. And that's actually something that the network sees and wants to support. I'll just quickly add on the, uh, and this is sort of also a question at the same time. The bandwidth into a storage provider is sort of, yeah, the last mile, but that there's this extensive network of routers and switches and so on that may require upgrading if someone's to go from that 10 gigabit to then, say, 20 or so on. Is that costing in any way being thought of? Because that, that's a, a large step, not just in terms of, oh, let's get another 10 gigabit link, but we might have to go from 20 gigabit switches and routers to 40, 100, whatever. I mean, I think the, the important thing is that you can see the demand and you can predict on it better. And that gives you the confidence to spend that CapEx to, to do that sort of upgrade. I have another quick comment just on the same topic, which is um, uh, I, I think this is giving you space in the deal-making market to set expectations and negotiate the cost for the people who are storing the data to then set the retrievability or the kind of like the expectations that they want for clients to fetch the data back. So I think on the, this is trying to push more of that into the early part of the market instead of trying to have clients pay for retrieval um, at later stages. A, because that's definitely what we found is the most common for um, data providers where you know most users when they fetch data sets aren't, aren't paying the bandwidth costs. It's the person who stores the data that tends to pay those costs. Um, and so I think this is creating the market space for that to be negotiated at deal time instead of at retrieval time, at least more often. I think the... The, there, there's some thought there, right, which is you want to at least know that there's that capacity so that you can have the space. And, and having SLAs helps us, or, or having, having these tiers helps us talk about these things of like, do you have the capacity to give me online data at a higher bandwidth? You may then say, hey, the baseline that I'm going to take is your archival level tier. And then we'll have a secondary bandwidth market where I say, actually, what I want to do is reserve an additional 10 gigs of bandwidth over the next month. How much is that going to cost? Like, I, I, I don't think the thought is you don't expect a secondary bandwidth market because, oh, hey, my picture got popular. How do I prepay? Or I think this picture, this movie is going to get popular before I get sort of like caught up in the, you've got my data and I haven't pre-reserved bandwidth and now you can extort me for it. I want to pre-negotiate some extra bandwidth so that we're good to go. Um, that, that that is going to be an evolving market. That can't all be predicted at deal time. And so there's going to be a secondary market around bandwidth and that shape um, that, that emerges. Um, but this is setting us up with some you know, small enum levels of service to talk about to then build that secondary market. And, and assuming this FIP gets passed, um, how would you modify the DStore REST API to work with these fields or, or whatnot? Or would they just It's be... probably just another config of what level of, of baseline retrieval is expected for that integrator's data. Makes sense. One yeah. more. I think I'm over time, so, but go for it. I hear you're fine. I'll be quick. Um, as someone who reads a lot of FIPS, and as you likely know, there are two major functionalities that FIPS play in signaling these types of changes. Um, one is uh, the FIP itself, which must be accepted by the community, and 
uh, proposes a protocol layer change. Um, the other are the FRCs, which are network standards. And what I'm trying to understand is, as you are preparing for implementing retrievability functionality long term, uh, why are SLA standards something that need to be encoded at the protocol layer rather than something we signal as a broader standard for network implementation teams? So this is proposing changes to some of the on-chain consensus structs and therefore is a consensus layer change. And what that's doing is providing network level visibility into the sort of total uh, shape of how much data retrieval providers have signed up for. So by changing the visibility of participants through as part of the consensus layer so that it becomes visible to any other network participant, that's a protocol level change. Got it. Interesting. I, and you're certainly more knowledgeable about this than I am, but I'd be interested in having a longer conversation perhaps at another time. Um, there seems to be a trend of other protocol development teams um, in the ecosystem who have been pushing a lot of changes at the protocol layer to decouple the way that metadata structures across to different actor structures so that it is easier and more interoperable. And I wonder how these changes in particular play into those changes um, and whether or not there is um, synergy there between those different needs. Absolutely. That makes sense. Thanks, Will. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm.